our planet, our response is looking at the main causes of biodiversity loss around the world, the importance of biodiversity, and how you can be part of the solution to combat the biodiversity crisis. Let's take a look at Daisy's response. The biodiversity crisis is the twin to the climate crisis. Our approach to tackling the climate crisis is relatively simple. Nations need to hit certain targets by certain times. But in many ways, the biodiversity crisis is even more complicated. It's hard to pinpoint what global action needs to be taken. We're talking about all life on Earth here. From bacterial communities in our soils to the whole ocean's ecosystem, these organisms' diversity and their interactions make up our planet's combined life support system. So how do we go about protecting this global life support system? I'm Daisy Gargi and I'm a climate justice activist. I work with grassroots change makers and organisations all across the world in fighting the climate crisis. In this episode, we're talking about climate change and more specifically, how the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis are interconnected. In the past, our planet has undergone dramatic shifts in its climate. And while some species have gone extinct, Many organisms, like animals and plants, have been able to adapt, evolve and survive. So most of the time, throughout the history of life on Earth, species have been able to cope with that rate of change and have been able to adapt or move to find more suitable conditions. But there have been times in the Earth's history when the climate has changed rapidly. And in those cases, we do see that there are mass extinction events and the current rate of human-induced climate change is also extremely rapid taking place over a time scale of around decades rather than millennia. This rapid climatic change has profound and varied effects on our planet's biodiversity. There is an increasing evidence base as more and more long-term data is studied and measured by researchers. So we thought it would be a good idea to illustrate some of the many impacts climate change has on biodiversity. Maybe a good place to start would be here in our largest coral reef system, the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. As the global surface temperature has risen by one degree Celsius, swiftly changing sea temperatures have resulted in the coral expelling their symbiotic algae. The result is what we call coral reef bleaching. If the corals are bleached for a long time, then they eventually die. Around 500 million people depend on the coral reefs for food its loss will have a profound social and economic impact. And let's go over here in the Alps to the mountaintops, where endemic alpine plant species, species found nowhere else in the world, are going extinct as they are forced up higher and higher as the global average temperature rises. And this is the Bramble K. Malamus, a tiny rodent found only on a tiny island in the Taurus Strait. This is the first mammal to be recognised as going extinct because of anthropogenic climate change. Rising sea levels inundated the island and destroyed the rodent habitat and the species along with it. This likely happened in 2016 and was officially recognised by the Australian government in 2019. The Woodland Trust collects data on um, what's called phenology, which is a study of timing of natural events. So an example is the blue tit, which coincides its nesting time with the peak of caterpillar abundance. The caterpillars feed on oak leaves, and they feed on the oak leaves at a specific time when they're just emerging and they're most tender. But due to climate change, oak trees are coming into leaf earlier. Caterpillars have managed to shift their hatching time, so they're in sync with the leaves coming out. But then higher up the food chain, the blue tits, which feed on the caterpillars, are not so easily able to adapt their nesting time. When their chicks hatch, they're not in sync anymore with the highest abundance of caterpillars, which has led to chicks starving in the nest. So the caterpillars are controlled by the blue tits when the ecosystem is balanced, but the caterpillars could more severely defoliate um, oak trees every year. 
and we don't know what impact that will have on the trees. So they need to be doing the right things in their lives at the right times to be able to survive and reproduce successfully. Climate change not only is a direct threat to humans, but most importantly, it threatens our planet's life support system, our biodiversity, and all the amazing organisms that make Earth an extraordinary planet. In our planet, our response, we aim to help you find solutions for combating the biodiversity crisis. And as you can imagine, climate change, probably more so than other video topics, has countless solutions that we can all take part in. You can look at solving climate change in two ways. You can look at it as reducing emissions by 10% next year in two years, or you can look at it as the fastest pathway to zero emissions. The first will lead you towards things like fly a little less, eat less meat, but it's going to reduce emissions by a little bit. But if you want to get to zero emissions, there is just no alternative. You need to fix the technological problems and you need to create the policy incentives to implement them. If you think action on the climate crisis has been slow, by comparison, the action on the biodiversity crisis is near and existent. So tackling these two challenges sounds daunting, right? Well, what if I told you combating both together is part of the solution? Rewilding is the restoration of all these bits of the jigsaw and all the systems, the processes that go to make up a, a naturally functioning ecosystem. We feel that that is the best way to get the maximum gain for biodiversity and for carbon. Biodiversity loss is directly driven by climate change, but at the same time, our biodiversity and the ecosystem services it offers provides ways of mitigating climate change. If natural systems are working properly, uh, they generally tend towards diversity and um, they're sequestering energy out of, out of the atmosphere and out of, the, out of the earth. Restoring, conserving and managing biodiversity can not only sequester carbon but help make us more resilient to the effects of climate change. In general, natural systems are much better at doing than that than systems that we create. And of course, when we as humans start to create different habitats like uh, uh, timber forests or grasslands for grazing animals, then something gives way, there's, a, there's, a, there's an upset to the system. Uh, and so rewilding is, is saying we've got these massive areas of land which are all doing the same thing, they're all serving the purpose of humans and we really need to bring nature back into the equation uh, a lot more if we want to tackle the, uh, those, that those twin crisis of biodiversity and climate change. So why not get involved in restoring nature? Maybe there is a local nature organisation near you that you can volunteer with. You could be directly contributing to nature-based solutions. We need the help of nature. We're, we've been acting against her for long enough and we need to bring her back in. So there we have it. The end of the series. Our planet, our response. The idea of biodiversity loss is anxiety-provoking enough and we don't want to add to that by overwhelming people with a pile of possible solutions. So what's the best approach? We think it's to find the solutions that work for you. It always feels like to care about the environment, you have to be like a real activist. And you know, you have to be quite extreme and super, super passionate. Not everyone is into STEM, not everyone is into science, not everyone's into engineering, but there are also all other roles surrounding these companies and these initiatives. Uh, we need accountants, uh, which you know, one of my favorite examples has absolutely nothing to do with the actual you know, direct innovation, but without an accountant, there is no like salary flow to the people who do it, which is kind of important. If I was looking at companies, I'd look at what they're saying, how they're, how they're saying it. Um, and also just look at their actions. Choose something that's impactful and you're going to make the world a better place. First, what are you good at? This might be professional expertise, but could just as easily be a hobby or even social skills or aspects of your personality. Can you take amazing photos, be an organiser or engage people? Second, what's the work that needs to be done? We've discussed some potential solutions, but you might be able to come up with an even longer list of creative and unique possibilities. Thirdly, what inspires you? You need to have a passion for what you're doing. If you don't, it'll become a slog and you won't stick with it. Where these three aspects intersect, that's where you should focus, where you have the biggest impact. So, this is our response. What's yours? <laughs>